Do you have in your life these certain phrases that you repeat over and over? So often that you say them, they've kind of become associated with you. And so when you start to say them, those in your life kind of knowingly nod their head. Or if you have teenage daughters, they roll their eyes at you. Do you know these phrases? So I definitely do these axioms. They kind of serve as a foundation of life for me. And so I'm going to share a couple of those with you today. Uh, One of my axioms for life is uh, one I picked up uh, at a conference one time. It's that language creates culture. The way we talk about things impacts the way that people view things. There are certain ways I want our family to communicate with one another that creates a certain culture in our home. Uh, Around here, one of my language create culture things that we talk about a lot as a staff is I don't like the word just when we're inviting people to volunteer. Uh, when we had our first child, I didn't want to walk our baby down the hall to somebody who was just willing to rock babies. Uh, I wanted somebody who knew that that 10-pound baby was the single most important human on planet Earth, and they would treat them with that kind of diligence. Do you understand what I'm saying? So like when we talk about student ministry and we talk about children's ministry, which are both growing so fast right now at our church, I don't want to just find people with a pulse and slide them into a slot. I would want our church to understand that 80% of people on this planet come to faith by the age of 18. And if you're looking for a place to have value and to work for Christ's kingdom in a way that is impactful, we'd love to talk to you about children and student ministry. That's not even a sermon point today, but I feel like we should pray and have revival about that right now. So if you're interested in serving in children and youth ministry, you can grab one of our staff or you can email us at infowithyourorchard.net. Language creates culture. Let's look at a second one. Like is more important than love. Uh, so we talk a lot in our family about how we like one another. And that's, that's even more meaningful to us than that we love one another. And, and you actually probably think this is true also. I'll tell you how we've experienced it. I'm willing to bet at some point you've been to a family reunion with a ton of people you love. But you get in the car and the doors slam and those that rode with you look at each other and go, I'm glad we just do this once a year. You know what I mean? You love them. If they needed something, you're there in a crisis. But it's not like you call them up and be like, you want to go run errands together? Like you, you don't, but I like the people that are most important to me. Like is more important than love. And then the last one that has kind of been my life axiom for the last 15 years is this. Uh, that which we do not do on purpose, we will accidentally never do. I, I work it into at least one sermon a year. Our staff hears it all the time. If we don't do it on purpose, we'll accidentally never do it. Our life is filled with too many things that we intend to get to. But we're too busy. We're too hurried. There's too much going on. And so we want to get to them, these things that are important, that they matter most. But we accidentally never get to them because we get distracted by all the things that are swirling around us. That, which we don't do on purpose, we'll accidentally never do. And in this series that we're called Make Room, the conversation we want to have is that if Jesus Christ entrusts one life to us, don't we want to live it on purpose? Don't we want to live it with intention and with clarity? And that's what I think we need to make room for today. Friends, my name is Will Rambo. I am one of the pastors here at the Orchard Tupelo. We're so excited that you're joining us as we are in week two of our series called Make Room. Last week, We talked about the hurried and fragmented pace with which we are moving and the effect that is having on our souls. And we did nothing practical. We just wanted to create a longing for Jesus to move in our lives. And so today we want to begin to build what that life might look like. So if you have your Bibles or a device that you read from, we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, 1 through 8. John is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the first four books of the New Testament. It's about 80 to 85% of the way through your Bible. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Open in the middle and go to the right some and you'll get there. If you don't have a Bible with you and you want to read along, raise your hand. Some of our greeters are moving around the room. They'd love to bring you a Bible. If you get one of those Bibles, page 648 will get you directly to John 15. You can use the Bible during the service. You can leave it in a chair when you're done. But if you don't own a Bible that you can read and understand, take this Bible, our free gift to you. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. By reading it, we understand more the truth of who God has called us to be. So if this Bible would help you, we want you to please take it. John 15, 1 through 8. I'm going to read it for us, and then we'll talk through it together. John 15, 1 through 8. Jesus is uh, talking this entire time. This is a straight quote. John 15. I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. 
He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in this passage. Uh, John 15 is part of a larger section. John 13 through 17 is the single most uninterrupted set of Jesus' teaching in the whole Bible, in all the Gospels. These are five of John's 21 chapters take place in one room at one time. This is the upper room the night before Jesus is to be crucified. They're in this room for several hours, and John writes 25% of his gospel is about these three or four hours. He writes down every word. He, what's already happened is they've had the Last Supper. They've, um, Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. He's announced that one would betray him, and Judas has left to arrange the arrest later that evening. And so now Jesus is here with the disciples, the 11 that remain, and he grabs a metaphor for them. He, he says, so my father is the gardener, I am the vine, and you, you 11, you, you are the branches. Jesus is making sure he know, that we know that connection to Jesus is about relationship, not transaction. Jesus doesn't require anything of me other than relationship. To receive the gift, he is freely given. And Jesus says, I, I'm the vine. You are the branches. You, a branch can't survive without the nutrients that come from the vine. And Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. But with me, you can bear much fruit. And so Jesus is figuring out how he will make this point and bring it home. And notice how many times he repeats the word remain. Or if you have a different translation, it very well could read abide. Uh, in the original language, it appears 10 times in these eight verses. It's repetitive. He's making a point. And it made such an impression on John, who writes this gospel, that in John's writings, this gospel, uh, some letters near the end of the Bible, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and John, and Revelation, John uses this one word over 50 times. The two most common words that John writes down in an ancient culture are remain or abide and love. It seems that John, who spent three years with Jesus, said the single most important thing that you and I could learn if we want to be a follower of Jesus is to remain in his love, to abide in his love and how he feels about us. That's the point that John is making here. Three years walking around listening to Jesus' teaching and he wants to pass something down to first century and 21st century readers and what he holds on to is we should remain in his love. We should be rooted in it. Everything that shows up in our life should grow out of this central relationship. And you know why I think he emphasized it so much? Because he knows how prone we are to wonder. He knows how distracted we get. He knows how many directions we get pulled in. He knew in the first and 21st century that, that things like power and politics and might be persuading to our heart. So he keeps emphasizing this, remain in Christ's love. And Jesus teaches us that if we do that, we will bear much fruit. The, the verse 5, we, apart from him, we can do nothing. But when our life is rooted in Jesus... We will bear much fruit. Now, in the New Testament, when they use the word fruit, there's two primary ways that they use it. It talks about the expanding of the kingdom, reaching new people. Uh, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. But come that we might have, come and put your hands in the labor that we might have this great harvest. We might bear much fruit. 
The other way that it is quite commonly used is, uh, like in Galatians chapter 5, Paul says there, there are fruits of the Spirit that when our lives are rooted in Jesus, it starts to have an effect. The evidence shows up. And we become more loving. We, we become more peaceful. We become more gentle and kind and generous and patient. Anybody in this room not need a little more patience? I know some of you do because I mentioned the, the uh, Crosstown train last week. And as of this moment, I have 39 pictures of people sitting at the Crosstown train <laughs> because you just thought I needed them. So you just sent them to me as if I've never seen the train before. But it's because you know, you know like I do, the evidence of places, how hurried we are, it shows up. What Jesus says is the reverse is true also. That the evidence of our remaining and abiding and digging our roots down into the truth of Jesus' love, it has an effect. It shows up in our lives. I mean, do any of us here not want to be more loving and kind and gentle and patient and peaceful? No, of course we do. Jesus says the way to do that is not to try harder. It's not to buckle down. It's to remain and abide in his love. I, I love this last line. Verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. What Jesus is saying is he can't fathom that anyone who follows after him wouldn't be so rooted in his love that the fruit doesn't begin to show up in their life. That, that there will be people who are drawn to the ways that things are growing up in us and they'll begin to ask questions and they'll want to explore it for themselves. We won't have to go beat them across the head with a Bible. We'll instead it, to live these rooted lives that when they ask questions, we're ready to speak the truth about what's happening in, in us and through us. That's what Jesus says. He can't fathom we wouldn't bear fruit. Now, friends, look, I know there's demands. I know there's requests for time. But, but are the things that are pulling in our lives that much more important? I mean, in the end of our days, is it going to be more valuable, the things that are pulling for our attention, the things we race from task to task to task for? Or will the greatest testimony of our life be what Jesus grew in and through us? And look, I, the, the evidence, the, the byproduct of being rooted, that's important. But there's an author I really like, Stephen Machia, in, in one of his books. Uh, he says that if we look after the roots, the fruits will look after themselves. If we look after the roots, and the fruits will look after themselves. In business, there's an axiom that I've picked up that we use. I mean, many of you have probably picked it up too. We, a lot of us use it. And it's that our systems are perfectly designed to get the results we're getting right now. That we're, our lives are perfectly designed to get the results that we're getting right now. If you feel overwhelmed, if we're stressed, if we're hurried, if we're pulled in every direction, it's because our system is built up in a way that that's the result. What Micah says is, look, if we'll build a system that looks after the roots, the byproduct will take care of itself. And so that... That leads to the, us thinkers, that's the way that the next question is, yeah, but how? Right? If you were here last week, we talked about that our only desire was to create a longing. We didn't do one practical piece last week. We just wanted to address the reality that many of us are weary and over, overburdened. We have the effects of hurry in our life. But today we want to begin to talk about how, and that's what we want to move through over the next several weeks. How? In a hurried world with too many commitments, do we begin to live differently? How do we assess? How do we see ourselves available to spend more time? How do we live on purpose? If Jesus has a design for our life that will bear fruit, that people will be drawn to it because of the growth that happens in our life, how do we live on purpose? I think there's a group that gives us a key. I think we need to think about the lives that monks live with one another. Now, at this moment, if you're a guest today, you are concerned that this is about to get very weird. But I don't think we have to become monks to learn from them. I, I, I don't think we have to become monks to learn from them. So when a group of monks live in a monastery together, they create a shared way of life. Now, I don't know what you know. We're not going to get into monastic life, but... They, they create a shared rule of this is how we're going to live our lives together. 
they're living in community with one another. Who's going to be responsible for a particular chores, activity? What is our rules about time of noise and time of silence and prayer and worship? They create a way that they're going to live our life. And in a monastery, it's known as the rule for the monastery. This is no different than what you do in your business. If you create a, a group of uh, staff values or office values, this is the culture we're creating in our, in our office, in our business, in my workplace. That, it's, it's legitimately not different at all. But it's called in their culture, it's called a rule. And, and there's a practice that dates back about 1,700 years that I think is an answer, we think is an answer to some of the hurry and fragmentation of our life. And that's that you and I figure out how to create what's called a rule of life. Are you living the life today that you want to live for the rest of your days? Do you feel like every cell of your body is moving in this ordered and clarified path that's leading you to life that really is life? Or do you feel the pull and the fragmentation? A rule of life begins to give us some order to it. Now, the word rule, uh, the original Latin word was used in different ways. And one of the ways it was used was it was also the word for a trellis, which a trevel, trellis is this instrument that's built that encourages growth in something that's living. It encourages growth. That's what a rule of life is. It's a trellis. It's, it supports growth. Think about that in light of what Jesus says in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide, remain in my love. Let's build a structure that in such a way it supports your growth. That's what a rule of life is. It's, uh, and I think we desperately need a trellis. We need a rule of life. Now, I want to be clear about language because language creates culture. It's a rule of life, not the rules of my life. It's a rule of life. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a bunch of rules. It's not a list of we don't do these bad things and we do these good things. That's not what a rule of life is. It's also not called the law of life. It, it, let's talk about the distinction between those two words. A law is externally generated and it is imposed on top of someone and you have to do it because it does tell you what is right and wrong. The laws of our land. That we're not about to create the law of life for the orchard and tell you, well, y'all got to do this. That's not the point. It's the rule of life. It's a guiding principles because a rule is self-generated. It just means we make it ourselves. I don't know your life. How am I going to tell you what your rule of life ought to be? You don't know my life. You can't tell me what my rule of life should be. But we want to have this framework for how we think about living the life that God has called us to. Now, a couple of things. A rule of life is descriptive. It describes the life that you actually want to live. You don't put anything on there and go, mm, I'm going to hate that. Because it's your life. It's a rule of life, the life that you're going to live. It becomes descriptive. It articulates our intentions, the way we actually want to live. But here's the beauty of a rule of life. It also is prescriptive. It, it, uh, it's prescriptive in that it shows you how we return to the path when we've gotten ourselves, caught ourselves wondering. When we wake up one day and go, well, this is not the life I actually want to live. When we have a rule in place, it becomes prescriptive to go, well, I know what leads me to life that really is life. I've just got to start living that way again. That's what a rule of life is. Now, now let's pause for a minute. In a room this size, there are some people going, well, I, I would never do this. This is silly. This is foolish. I'll just make a commitment, and I won't follow through on it. And to that, I think many of us would agree, because that which we don't do on purpose, we'll accidentally never do. But we want to learn to live on purpose. And what's so powerful is you actually already have a rule of life. You do. You've just not clarified it. This was so helpful for me to learn when I read Machia's book. Stephen Machia says, all of us have an unwritten personal rule of life that we're following. But the difference is that some is with clarity and some unknowingly. You have a certain time you wake up, you get ready for our days in a particular order, you use our free time for assorted purposes, practice rhythms of work, hobby, worship, vacation, and so on. There is already a rule in place that you are following today. 
Isn't it time to give up our unwritten rule and prayerfully write one that more closely matches the heartbeat of God? You already have a pattern. If, if you were ever over at my house on an evening, and we had dinner and we sat around in the den, I get fidgety about 9 o'clock. Do you know why? Because it's in bed. It's time to go to bed. I want you to go home. Like, I'm ready to go to bed. I'm tired. I'm, that, that's the end of my day. That, the, if I can perfectly wire it, I have a rhythm. I don't always do it, but that's the rhythm I long for. I like that rhythm. It's my personal rhythm. I had coffee with a friend this week, and we were, I love to bounce off a sermon with somebody. And uh, they are a fan of one of the in-state football institutions. And they, were say, they laughed when I brought this quote up because they were like, this is me at the tailgate because I'm in charge of the tailgate. I packed the trailer a certain way. We're going to leave the house at a certain time. We're going to set it up in a certain order. I was like, that is a rule of life. I was like, that which you don't tailgate on purpose, you'll accident anyway. It doesn't work. But you get my point. We all got unwritten rules. All that I'm inviting you into is that we clarify. We have a certain way we like life. Why don't we clarify it around the things that matter most? So if we need a rule and we don't know what it looks like, we want to help you. We've created a resource for you today. There are tables uh, by the two exit doors there, both sets of doors into the foyer, the exit doors over here, and the exit towards the children's ministry here. There's a uh, pub table with these white cards that look just like this. And you're like, well, Will, I can't see that. No problem. I'll put it on the TV for you. On one side, it gives you some instructions. And on the other, it gives you these four categories, daily, weekly, and monthly. Spiritual practices, rest, relationships, and work. Work doesn't just mean your job. Some of you go, well, I'm a stay-at-home parent. I'm retired. I mean, I, great, because work is more about the vocation, the calling of our life. That some of us do have work rhythms and responsibilities, but some of us also have things that God is asking us to do. It's those exterior responsibilities. As a matter of fact, if uh, later in the service we're going to mention again that on Wednesday night, September 6th, once a month right now, we're trying what we call formation night. And on September 6th, I'm going to teach and we're going to walk through just this first quadrant of what spiritual practices could and should maybe look like in our lives. And we're going to give you a lot of options and a way to build your own rule of life. Because we want you to bring this with you for the next several weeks or if you're watching online. And we want you to bring it and have it so that we can help you. We're going to help you fill it in. There is no test, but we're going to give you all the answers anyway, okay? We're going to help you build it. I'll even give you some examples today. Let's talk about it in my own life. One, I have a daily, one of my daily spiritual practices is reading Scripture. I love to read the Bible every morning. I'm a morning person. You do not have to be. That is my rule of life. I read in the morning during my first cup of coffee or until the first child wakes up. And at 6.30, if nobody's awake, everybody gets up. But I have a 30-minute window that belongs to God. I just drink coffee and I read. And on Saturday mornings, which is my day, is one of my days off, I actually like to read for an extended period of time because we're not often as hurried on Saturday as we are the rest of the week. And so that's a rhythm for me. Uh, let's go to the next quadrant. My family works to practice Sabbath. It's not on Sundays because I have to work today. But for us, we try to shoot from Friday night to Saturday night as best we can to at least have a designated set of hours where we're practicing Sabbath, where the dishes pile up, where I can't complain about clothes that are left in a kid's floor, that for at least six hours I have to hold my tongue because in that time we're going to rest in the fact that God is good enough, that the world still spins when we slow down. One whole sermon this series, we're going to talk just about how to apply Sabbath in our lives. Let's go to the uh, relationships quadrant. Uh, in the relationships quad quadrant, uh, monthly, I try to schedule dates with Marissa. Now, remember what I said about descriptive and prescriptive. This is really good for my life and for my marriage that regularly we sit across the table from one another and neither of us have to cut up chicken tenders for anybody else. It's good for us. But think about what I said about prescriptive. When Marissa and I find ourselves at odds, when we're arguing a lot, when we, we are easily annoyed with the other, do you know what one of the problems probably is? We haven't sat across the table and reminded each other that we like each other because like is far more important than love. We've forgotten that. And so we've, it becomes not just something that helps us stay healthy, it's something that gets us back to health when we've become unhealthy. 
healthy. And then the last one is like in work. For me right now, I'm trying to block a monthly time to finish. I'm working on my doctorate degree. I'm trying to finish my doctoral dissertation because, dear God, it hangs over me all the time. Because I'm done with class, I just have to write about 35 pages, and it's not due till March 1st. Do you know what doesn't feel urgent in my life right now? Anything due March 1st. But I'm ready to get it done, so I don't keep blocking time every month. But I, I need to protect that time so that it gets finished so I can get on to the other tasks that God's going to ask me to work on. Th- these are just a few practical ways that this plays out for us to make room. It is challenging. It will mean you say a no to some things you love doing. But in John 15, Jesus says, My father, my, the gardener comes and he, and he prunes that which is not bearing fruit. And he prunes some things that are bearing some fruit, so they'll bear more fruit. That's the image he gives us. Is It's going to be challenging, but we are sleepwalking through life saying yes. And we need to learn how to have the strength to make some intentional no's. I'm going to give you one practical example about how this plays in my life. I have done a lot, I've officiated a lot of weddings. And I love to officiate a wedding. But I'm in a season in my life where there's only so many I can do each year because we have three small kids at home. And I want to spend time with them. And in those, about five years ago, I began to make a practice where I, with very rare exception, and it's usually because of location or calendaring or a a new place I've never done a wedding, I, I am not able to go to rehearsals right now. It's not because I don't love rehearsals. It's not because I don't want to come eat your prime rib and chicken and steak. I would like to eat all of those things. It's because for the next nine years, if I did 10 weddings a year and took 10 Saturday nights and 10 Friday nights, I gave up 20% of my weekends before we made any other family plans away from three small humans that I'm responsible for. And in this season... I just can't do it. Now, if you'll just put off your wedding for nine years, Marissa and I would love to have our date night at your wedding rehearsal and eat your steak and prime rib. So if you can just hold off a a decade, I'm good. I'm in. We would love to get dressed up and let you pay for our date. That would be amazing. But in this season, in this season, we have 15 people on staff that can officiate a wedding. But only one person is Marissa's husband. And, and I'm the only dad that Lilla and Kinley and Isaac have. And if you're going to ask me to make those choices, I will, I'll have to make a pruning decision to say no so that I can say another yes. Because I only get this window. I only get this season. That's what it means for us to make these choices. It was uncomfortable for me at first. I am naturally a people pleaser. But you know what? God is so good and so gracious that every person I've said, I can't make it. I can't come on Friday night. I I can't even work in the way. But here's my only reason why. It's because of my people. Do you know how gracious people have been? At least to my face and on the phone. I don't know what they said when they hung up, but I I feel okay about it. People have understood. They've been so kind. Maybe we need to learn to say some hard no's so we can receive the gift of what God wants us to say yes to. And that's just a reality for me. And I think for all of us, I'm 44 years old. I feel great, but I'm realistic. My life is well more than halfway over, quite probably. And I'm not sad or anxious about that, that this life is just a precursor to the one that doesn't ever end. And so I'm not sad or anxious about that, but I'm realistic about it. And at some point, I've got to figure out, what am I doing? Am I, if time is the commodity we can never renew, or do you and I want to keep sleepwalking in a life we don't want? Rather than to stop, make room, and evaluate for the life Jesus invites us to, that is life that really is life. To quote the great theologian from Shawshank Redemption, Andy Dufresne, I guess it's a simple choice, really. We get busy living or we get busy dying. I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my days. I want to live the life that is entrusted to me. The invitation for us today is to make room and to order the room that we've made. We will never accidentally wake up and find ourselves transformed to be more like Jesus. It doesn't happen accidentally. We won't stumble our way into holiness. But we have, if we have this one shot, don't you want to live your shot on purpose? Don't we want to live the set of day, time? days are not promised. Don't we want to live them on purpose? 
then let us no longer put off that which we actually wanna do, but let's live with intent today. What do you need to make room for Jesus to do in your life? What do you need to prune out of your life to make more room for him to move? To move, not to live accidentally, but intentionally. John could have written anything down and what John said was the single most important thing for us was to abide and remain in Christ's love for us. How do you and I do that? That's what we're talking about today. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. I want to invite you into a moment of prayer. I want to share with you a way I've been praying for several months. In a couple of settings, I've shared this with some of you, but we've not ever done this on a Sunday morning. We may do it again on a Sunday morning. But I want to invite you into a simple way of prayer. I do it every morning as a part of my own time. So however you pray, settle yourself in, close your eyes, keep your eyes open, take a couple of deep breaths. I want you to imagine the most beautiful thing, the place, beautiful location you've ever been yourselves. Grand Canyon, a beach, some part of uh, the world that a lot of people hadn't visited, wherever you've been, wherever the most beautiful scene you've ever witnessed. I want you to imagine it. Just take it in. Hear the sound, smell what, what you smell in that location. And then while you stand there and you're taking in that place that you've been, you know what it feels like to stand right there. You have a tap on your shoulder and you turn around quickly and Jesus is standing right there, however you imagine Jesus to look. And upon making eye contact with you, the savior of the world smiles so big, he begins to laugh and he wraps his arms around you in this warm embrace. Not not a soft hug, but the kind of hug where your shoulders hurt just a little bit and your breath is squeezed from your lungs as pierced hands pat you on the back like family does. What if we were to abide in the truth that that's how Jesus loves us. Father God, I pray that we would make room for you to move and speak and work in our lives. Give us guidance and instruction how we might build a life that helps form and shape us to be more like your son, Jesus. To you, our Father, In the name of Christ and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.